Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our group reading of Julius Evola's The Hermetic Tradition. In this second lecture, we will examine chapters 11 through 20 within part 1. And I'd like to remind you that this is a response to a patron's request to um, study in depth uh, a text which um, is perhaps less widely read than Evola's uh, better known works like, say, Revolt Against Modern World, but which is still uh, crucial to understand <laughs> those more familiar texts, and it's certainly a fascinating text in its own right. Um, this is then a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So if we get right back into our reading of the text with chapter 11, the four elements and sulfur, you might recall that we had uh, finished last lecture by realizing that the properly alchemical interpretation of that all too familiar symbol of the cross really is, in a certain sense, the intersection of two other more basic alchemical symbols. Those were the vertical line symbolizing a spiritual ascent upwards and a horizontal line symbolizing a spiritual descent. An additional meaning which is made hermeneutically accessible, though, through this combination of those two lines into one symbol is that you actually get, as a result, four different sections of the cross, each of which symbolizes a different one of the four elements of ancient physics. These four elements, in turn, each are revealed to have a rightful, rather than purely random place within the totality represented by the cross, as we know now that fire really is above, earth really is below, and air and water really are to the right and left, respectively. What, though, are the symbols of these four elements of nature within the alchemical tradition? Well, we've already learned that the symbol of water is the upside-down triangle indicative of a fall, while the symbol of fire is the right-side-up triangle indicative of an ascent. Earth, then, is the upside-down triangle of the fall of water, but qualified by an additional horizontal line to indicate a certain stoppage, which, of course, results in the familiar character of solidity associated with the Earth. On the other hand, air is the right-side-up triangle of fire, but with that same horizontal line added in to indicate a certain break or stoppage in the ascent upwards. All four symbols, then, are um, represented as you see on the screen. We are now able, then, to see that the cross really is just the symbol of the primordial unity of all four elements, or as Evola says himself, the underlying substratum and principle of life. It bears mentioning, though, that in alchemical practice, the sign of the cross is rarely encountered in isolation, more often being combined with other symbols in order to express powers that stand over the four elements, as Evola says himself, such as in the great example of sulfur. Sulfur is a power of fire, but one which is still left in that impure, lower state of naturalistic becoming. In chapter 12, Soul, Spot, a Spirit, and a Body, um, Evola briefly pauses in order to warn the reader that the terminology of alchemy does not perfectly overlap even with the traditional terminology of, say, Western religion. Although spirit and soul, for example, are basically treated as interchangeable synonyms today, even by the people who quote-unquote still believe that they exist, the two hold very different meanings within the alchemical tradition. According to Evola, soul is associated with personality, while spirit refers rather to a whole package of lower psychobiological energies which lie somewhere between the corporeal and the non-corporeal as such. This is, quote-unquote, the animating principle of the organism which is present in life and, of course, vanishes at the moment of death. In properly alchemical terms, then, this necessary distinction among body, spirit, and soul might be expressed most clearly through the symbols of a solar soul of being, a lunar-slash-mercurial spirit of becoming, and a body whose fall is expressed by salt. 
If Oleg goes on to also interpret man's powers in terms of those four elements by noting that the element of earth, for example, expresses the power of a materialistic interpretation of the world conditioned by a kind of perception that takes for granted the opposition between the I and the not I, which more advanced modes of knowing will later reveal to be something of an illusion. This is, of course, the mode of the body, or of salt, or stone. Interestingly, Evola claims that the ordinary person who never leaves this default natural attitude is not completely unfamiliar with the other elements, for although he or she cannot know them in a direct state of purity, they can still be made manifest through the dominant earth element. At the same time, such earthing of these other elements, which require a consciousness different from that of the body, can only be honestly described as an impurity or shadow in comparison with the real thing. At chapter 13, The Four in Man, Evola clarifies that one must be very careful to recognize a certain distinction with regard to the energies of spirit between the corporeal and spiritual energies bound to the body and the non-corporeal energies which are imparted to a higher solar quality through their association with soul. Clearly, there is a certain prioritization of the animalistic body and the earth force which acts through it over the higher faculties, for these lower desires make up the default state which is immediately accessible and which only later come to be subordinated to those higher ideals and certainly not by all within the population. This prioritization of the body to a default or first state of man is, of course, mythically expressed by the figure of Saturn, who had ruled over that first age of the Golden Age, but is also associated with the vastly distant era when monstrous titans ran amok and had not yet been subordinated to the order of the gods. This ambiguity is perhaps reinforced also by Saturn's double role as both the father slash origin of the gods and the vanishing mediator who eats them up as soon as they're born, a narratological expression of the mystery of materialism as both the realm of suffocatingly rigid and fixed entities and of entities whose existence is so ephemeral that they disappear as soon as they appear. Second in line, we can consider the lunar fluid mercury, which corresponds to the element of water. Interestingly, this is symbolically grasped as a double of the Saturn body, or the life of it, which carries the peculiar kinds of energies which are inherited from one's ancestors, which make up a quote-unquote racial character not limited strictly to the lower body. In terms of perspectival consciousness, this element makes up the threshold over which exterior contents somehow are able to penetrate into the interior. What is the word for this, though, except the senses? Why, then, does Evola not just lump all of these in with the earthly element of the physical body? Well, the reason is that normal physical perception of brute physical objects is only part of the story. For this threshold through which exterior passes into interior is also at work in, say, the psychic perception of paranormal phenomena, which is equally deserving of the title sensing. We can then move on to consider the third element of air as the gaseous state resulting from the intersection of water and the heat of fire, symbolized once again by the triangle qualified by that horizontal line. This is really the power of movement, but movement understood as a stoppage of the purifier, a power of change but one constrained by the physical limitations pre-given in the body. Finally, then, we move on to the element of fire as the solar power of the intellect as such, and the principle of one's individuation into some particular ego. Although all four I have just mentioned are, of course, present in man all the time, the ordinary person, stuck in the natural attitude, only ever knows them in a confused manner which blurs their distinctions and obscures their true character. 
the path of alchemy can lead the knower on a journey through each of these four elements in which they are known as such, rather than in the confused earthly state. In chapter 14, The Planets, we find that although we have already considered the three creative principles, that is, body, soul, and spirit, and we have also considered the four elements, we must now consider the three and the four together. But what will that give us except the highly meaningful number of seven, not coincidentally, that which was known to be the perfect number? Alchemically, seven expresses the idea of nature creating nature in action. As we learned last lecture, this process of creation is not an event lying somewhere in the vastly distant past which began and ended long ago, but is instead an eternal creation which is not only in the cosmos but in all of us too. At this point of the text, Evola emphasizes that the seven principles are both interior and exterior, for they concern both man and the world, and concern both things visible and things invisible. It is also no coincidence that Plato described the Wheel of Fate as being composed of seven spinning spheres ruled by the daughters of necessity. Though this is not the full story, for according to Plato himself, beyond these seven lies an eighth monad representing a unity of another kind and lying on another plane of being altogether. In the alchemical literature, this idea becomes the desire to go beyond the limits of the circles of necessity in order to reach and to master that creative power symbolized by the higher fire itself. Who, though, was the iconic mythological figure who actually did seize that creative power of the fire of the gods and dared to return to the lower realm of earthly limitations in order to unleash it in this world for mere mortals, except, of course, Prometheus himself? This intersection of the fire above and the lower limitations embodied by the figure of Prometheus is hermeneutically quite ambiguous, as one hermetic text describes this figure as being both above sleep and yet at the same time still dominated by that sleep. Sleep, of course, is a metaphor for the kind of consciousness of one who is still caught up in the lower limitations of the animalistic body. So the Promethean figure is the one who is caught up not so much in two different levels of being, so much as two different modes by which being might be made phenomenally manifest. Stated in those terms, mythological images of the seven-headed dragons guarding caverns with a corporeal meaning or treasures of gold with a super-corporeal meaning suddenly make much more sense. In chapter 15, The Centers of Life, Evola pauses to note that we must now ask what seven might mean in the context of man himself. Interestingly, while the seven refer to specific points of contact through which higher powers intersect with man's corporeality, the classical texts also identify these powers with seven planets. But just as they can flow into corporeality, so too can this orientation be reversed back to the non-human realm which lies beyond. The overcorporealization of these planetary powers reduces them to the status of vulgar passions which man passively and subconsciously suffers, but conversely the ascent back up to the supercorporeal planetary realm goes beyond the seven to eventually land at the eighth, that monadic unity of being in itself referenced by Plato, which lies in the superplanetary realm of the stars, a realm beyond any lower ideas of becoming, alteration, or difference. The one who obtains this transcendent knowledge is described in the classical texts as becoming a god. Likewise, because the lower sphere of necessity and limitation is symbolized as water, the biblical reference to those who can walk on water suddenly makes much more sense. In chapter 16, the seven, the operations in the mirror, 
Evola notes that he is finally able to declare it possible to begin interpreting the alchemical texts now that the pr preliminary education in its symbolism is sufficiently covered. How, though, do the classical texts themselves speak of such an initiation? Well, often references to entering a river or some other body of water seven times symbolize the operations of working through the liquid metal mercury up to the final stage of gold. Similarly, the operations might be symbolized temporally as, say, spans of seven years or spatially as a set of seven different doors. What, though, does all of this really mean? Evola claims that the seven really stand for the non-human forms of consciousness and energy, which can be obtained in practice rather than merely contemplated theoretically. Likewise, the classical texts do indeed reference a double possibility of pursuing either necessity or freedom, an alternative which can, of course, only be resolved in practice. In chapter 17, Gold in the Art, Evola notes that we call it the royal art because it concerns the operations to be performed on lower materials, which could never rise up to that higher level if simply left to the imperfect state which nature had left them in. For this reason, the texts actually do make a crucial distinction between the gold which is naturally produced and the gold which can only be reached through the intervention of the art. Once again, alchemy is unique in its emphasis on fabricating gold rather than simply discovering it. In chapter 18, Shadow, Ashes, and Remains, Evola opens this chapter with the mysterious, almost Hegelian meditation on the hermetic idea that life arrives through the double negation of having the dead pass through death. This reference to the dead, however, must not be taken too literally, for the alchemical tradition uses this term as a metaphor for the one who is still lulled into a state of sleep, which is itself a metaphor for the natural attitude of materialistic perception. Under this view, the body comes to be recognized as a type of prison, which holds the spirit back from realizing its full potential. But rather than actively use its own energies, such a figure still passively experiences them as so many passions or sensations. Alchemical references to working this copper until all traces of darkness are removed from it therefore make much better sense when applied to one's understanding of one's own self. Contrary to one's initial expectations, then, the alchemical tradition does not support a mystical flight away from the body altogether, for as we have seen in the previous lecture, this would defeat its own purpose by missing the deeper point that this body is itself the principle of individuation, which must be spiritually elevated through work rather than abandoned to that lower state. In the text, then, one is warned not to discard the ashes because it is from that source that the gold is made. Or in more mythological terms, this is the gold which we are told is hidden in Saturn. Such a body associated with the elevated value of gold will escape the archetypally feminine flux of material becoming in order to acquire the archetypally masculine stability of being, but the relation between those two phases will indeed prove to be more complicated than one might initially expect, as we will see in the later sections of part one. For this reason, insofar as one works with the fire, it is not the reckless, uncontrolled flame of destruction, but rather the controlled flame that improves rather than simply dissolves the material under consideration. Chapter 19, Philosophical Incest. Evola asks whether it is possible to pass from the gold back down to the mercury, or from the individuated being back to the formless, de-individuated flux of becoming. Evola notes that the alchemical tradition does indeed speak of such a liquefaction, both as something which one can suffer passively, and as something which one can perform or pursue actively. 
Given these criteria, Evola clarifies that the goal of alchemy is not a mystical dissolution of the I, so much as a coordinated rebirth of the I hidden in the shadows, to use his own phrase. For this reason, one classic text noted that the fixed becomes volatile for a while, only in order to acquire a nobler quality, the better to fix the same volatile again. The temporary transition to feminine dominance is therefore symbolically interpreted really as the mother which then gives birth to the masculine son, who is decidedly gifted with the power of being greater than either of his parents. In chapter 20, The Tomb and Thirst, we find that if we conceptualize this passage into the flux of becoming in terms of a liquefaction, it is clear that the alchemical interpretation of the myth of Narcissus is that of one who had fallen into this water and had drowned only after falling for a reflection in those waters which he fell in love with because it did indeed capture the image of himself. To return to an irony noted earlier, this state of death in the water of becoming and mere reflections is what most people mistakenly call life. Yet this tomb of Osiris is not the end of the story, but only a passing phase in the conversion of the same body into the sepulchre of the living. The goal of alchemy then is not to do away with the body as principle of individuation, for then one could not satisfy the criteria of rising up to the status of the absolute individual.